the young Goethe, 1749 to 1775. November 1775, a coach on its way from Frankfurt to Weimar. The coach is carrying only two passengers. What one of them, the Weimar courtier, is thinking, we do not know. He's been sent to accompany the other man. But we are able to reconstruct the feelings of the second passenger quite precisely. Johann Wolfgang Goethe, a newly qualified doctor of law, is filled with great expectations. He's been invited by Duke Karl August to come to the court at Weimar. Goethe feels that his future is about to begin. A new and important phase in his life is opening up before him. It's time to leave the past behind. What can the future hold in store? The past fades with every mile of his journey, yet a wealth of experiences and insights, feelings of disillusion and disappointment go with him. Faust's first meeting with Gretchen. By this time, a number of the works which have made Goethe world famous were already completed. Or if they were not completed, they were at least planned. Clavigo, The Sorrows of Werther, some of his most beautiful poems, Stella, Egmont, and above all, the original version of Faust, the Urfaust. This play is written in the explosive language of storm and stress, the romantic and revolutionary movement which Goethe helped to found. It's a work into which he poured all his anguish and experience. Like his character, Faust, Goethe had found a new vocabulary for the expression of feelings and emotions. Like Faust, he'd fallen victim to passion, but he couldn't decide on a girl of his choice. And like Faust, Goethe is searching for the meaning of the world. He's not quite prepared to enter into a pact with the devil, but he's clearly unable to content himself with conventional ideas. Lass er mich mit dem Gesetz in Frieden. Und das sage ich ihm kurz und gut. Wenn ich das süße, junge Blut heute Nacht in meinen Armen ruht, sind wir um Mitternacht geschieden. Bedenkt, was gehen und stehen mag. Er gibt uns um wenigst 14 Tage nur die Gelegenheit zu spüren. Hätte ich nur sieben Tage Ruhe, braucht keinen Teufel nicht dazu. Frankfurt am Main, a free city of the Empire. In Goethe's day, the city already had a thousand year history. the navigable river, cobbled streets, elegant patrician houses, churches and monasteries. Frankfurt was the home of an educated and liberal bourgeoisie. Thanks to its trade fair, the city had become a rich and important commercial center. For centuries, the German emperor had been elected in Frankfurt. Am Großen Hirschgraben, Midsummer 1749. Great excitement fills the house of the imperial councillor, Johann Kaspar Goethe. <laughs> On the 
On the stroke of midday, on the 28th of August, 1749, I was born in Frankfurt am Main. My horoscope was favourable. The sun was in the sign of Virgo. Jupiter and Venus looked on with a friendly eye. Saturn and Mars remained indifferent. These factors may have played a part in my survival. Due to the clumsiness of my midwife, I was thought to be stillborn, and only after great efforts was I revived. The child Wolfgang grows up in upper middle class surroundings. The well-appointed home, am Hirschgraben, is the scene of his first experiences in life. Experiences, the treasure store that we gather mainly during our childhood years and draw on later as adults. That is true of all of us, but it's especially true of writers and poets. First, there are the child's parents. The father, Johann Kaspar Goethe, is a sober, rather pedantic man. From him, Goethe inherits his serious nature. From his lively, imaginative mother, Katerina Elizabeth, he gets his joy in inventing stories. Then there's Goethe's sister, Cornelia, one year younger than Wolfgang. She's Goethe's first friend and conversation partner. And finally, there are the neighbours' children. In a sense, they are the audience before which the young Goethe gives his first spectacular performance. A crockery fair had just been held, and our kitchen had been stocked up with new pots and pans. One fine afternoon, when all was quiet in the house, I was playing with some plates and dishes. When I grew bored with this, I hurled a dish out into the street and took great delight in watching it smash. This performance made quite an impact. Goethe's playmates demanded an encore. Can any artist resist that? And because my friends demanded more, I sent all the crockery I could find to the same doom. Goethe's father supervises his son's education, and, as was usual at the time, Wolfgang is taught chiefly by private tutors. He learns ancient and modern languages. As a ten-year-old, he reads Virgil, Robinson Crusoe, German fairy tales, and, above all, Homer. Antiquity plays a part in the child's life in other ways, too. The engravings in the hall of the family home may have aroused his longing for Italy at an early stage. But the news from abroad was, even in those days, seldom good news. On the 1st of November, 1755, an earthquake struck Lisbon and horrified a world that was accustomed to living in peace and tranquillity. 60,000 people died. I was deeply affected. God, the creator and preserver of heaven and earth, had behaved in a very unfatherly way. The Lisbon earthquake was a great shock, but the world in which the young Goethe grew up was full of other flaws and blemishes. The affluence of the towns was not to be found everywhere, and social conditions in rural areas were often pretty dreadful. The nations of Europe were frequently at war with each other, and the French Revolution was still a long way off. In 1759, the French occupy Frankfurt, and a high-ranking officer takes up quarters in the Goethe's house. 
The French occupation placed a great burden on the people of Frankfurt, and no one felt the strain more than my father. He was obliged to accept strangers into his home and to place his well-polished reception rooms at their disposal. He was forced to surrender his strict control of the house to foreign lodgers. In his own way, the young Goethe profits from the French occupation. So far, the only theatre he's ever seen has been puppet theatre. But now, thanks to a friend, he's able to go every day to the performances of a real theatre company. He sees plays by Racine and Molière in the original French. Soon, as a 13-year-old, he begins to write verses of his own. Soudain, il me refait une autre révérence. Moi, j'en refais de même une autre en diligence. Et lui, d'une troisième aussitôt repartant, d'une troisième aussi, j'y repars à l'instant. Le monde, chère Agnès, c'est une étrange chose. Voyez la médisance et comme chacun cause. Il passe, vient, repasse et toujours de plus belle, me fait à chaque fois révérence nouvelle. Et moi, qui tous ces tours fixement regardais, nouvelle révérence aussi je lui rendais. He takes riding, dancing and fencing lessons. When he begins to show some skill at these things, his father believes that his son is ready to go out into the world. Perhaps the fact that Goethe had already been involved in his first love affair had something to do with this too. Octave. Among his friends, Goethe meets a girl called Gretchen. She's later to become the model for the character Gretchen in Faust. Never before had a female made such a deep impression on me. I had no excuse to visit Gretchen at home, and I didn't want to search for one. So I went to church to look for her there. I soon discovered where she sat. The 16-year-old Goethe gets no further than exchanging polite greetings with Gretchen. Without much of a backward look, he takes the post-coach to Leipzig, where he's to begin his studies. He arrives there on the 3rd of October, 1765. During the preceding decades, Leipzig, famous for its trade fair and university, had attracted the leading minds of Germany. Goethe, too, comes under its spell. It's in Leipzig that he has his first real experience of the world. But for his courses in law and the arts, the young student can raise little enthusiasm. None of the lectures he attends seems to deal with real life. Even the classes of Christian Gellert, a well-known poet and professor of moral philosophy at Leipzig, fail to satisfy him. And so Goethe decides to launch his own investigations into life. He sets out on a path which is destined to lead to a new awareness of the capabilities and potentialities of modern man. He takes courses in copperplate engraving and etching. He writes poems in the ornate and elegant Rococo style. And so I adopted a habit which was to remain with me for the rest of my life. I would come to terms with everything that delighted, tormented, or otherwise preoccupied me by turning it into an image or a poem. This gift will one day save Goethe's life. The young man has a tendency to go to extremes, and soon his love for Ketch and Schoenkopf, the first truly passionate relationship in his life, plunges him into the most profound despair. Seeing Ketchen in the company of a businessman at the theatre one evening, Goethe flies into a jealous rage. The pain of this experience prompts him to write, and Goethe the poet is born. He describes the incident in a famous letter. In the theatre, I found her box. She was sitting in the corner. Behind her stood a gentleman in a very attentive pose. Just think. Imagine me in the gallery, watching this scene through an opera glass. I felt as if my head was about to burst with anger. My heart was pounding. Suddenly I was gripped by a terrible fever, and I thought I was going to die at any moment. I did not walk, I dashed out of that theatre. If you can think of anyone who is unhappier than I am, despite my wealth and other advantages, name him, and I shall be silent. At the end of his three-year stay in Leipzig, Goethe experiences a crisis. In 1768, 
he suffers a violent hemorrhage, and for days his life is in serious danger. His parents, terrified by their son's illness, order him to return to Frankfurt at once. It takes Goethe nearly 18 months to recover from his illness. His sickness has put him in a solemn frame of mind, and he concerns himself with religious problems. When his health improves, he begins to conduct scientific experiments. The study of the natural sciences will occupy Goethe for the rest of his life. In 1770, he's able to resume his law studies, and he moves to Strasbourg. Here, he evolves an entirely new attitude to life, which sees everything in terms of emotion, passion, and reason. He develops a new, richer understanding of the individual. On his very first day in Strasbourg, Goethe visits the famous cathedral. The Gothic style of the minster, regarded in those days as primitive and barbaric, appeals to his inspired mood. How unexpected was the sensation which overcame me when I first stood before the cathedral. I could almost taste the tremendous impression which the sight made upon me. Yet, because this feeling was made up of thousands of individual and interlocking pieces, I could not explain it. I often went back there. I inspected the cathedral from all angles and distances, in every shade of the daylight. Goethe learns to discipline himself. He forces himself to tolerate loud noise, which he previously couldn't bear. He tries to accustom himself to the most repulsive sights in anatomical science. High up in the spire of the cathedral, he tries to cure his vertigo. Goethe's friends also champion the cause of the individual. Anyone who wants to be taken seriously has to prove that he's a real man, has to fight and fence, tell dirty jokes and brag. The young generation expresses its new belief in the individual in violently exaggerated language. In his new sense of his own value, it becomes imperative for man to aspire to genius. A new era is dawning. It's named after a famous play of the period, Storm and Stress. Goethe meets the new challenge. We must look closely at things and inscribe them in our memory. We must be observant. It's not enough to be anything. We should want to become everything. In Strasbourg, Goethe meets the writer and philosopher Johann Gottfried Herder, who introduces him to the works of Shakespeare. He encourages Goethe's interest in folk poetry, and a new tone begins to emerge in the verses Goethe writes at this time. My heart beat fast, and quick as a flash, I was on my horse. The earth lay in the arms of the dusk, and night hung over the mountains. Goethe wrote these lines for Friederike Brion. He had met her in Zesenheim, a village near Strasbourg. She was the daughter of a Protestant parson. Here in Zesenheim, Goethe enjoys the company of Friederike's happy family. He joins in their conversations, games and dances. He's found a new, pure love. I find myself in a most strange situation. I am blessed with beautiful surroundings, people who love me, and a good circle of friends. And yet, I begin to realize that we're not content even when our wishes are fulfilled. It takes a great deal of courage to be happy in this world. This time, it's Goethe who breaks off the relationship. He's afraid of becoming too attached to Friederike. Friederike's reply to my farewell letter broke my heart. Only now did I appreciate the loss she had suffered, and I could see no way to replace it or even to alleviate it. She was always in my thoughts, and I was constantly aware of how much I missed her. For the first time in my life, I was guilty. 
I had wounded the most lovely heart. Euer Bischof lärmte dem Kaiser die Ohren voll, als wenn ihm Wunder wie die Gerechtigkeit ans Herz gewachsen wäre. Und jetzt wirft er mir selbst... Goethe returns to Frankfurt and shortly afterwards writes his first major play. It's the story of Goetz von Berlichen, the knight with the iron hand. Er sollte bei meinem Alt, er hat getan, wie er sollte. So gewiss er mit eurem und des Bischofs Wissen gefangen ist. Meint ihr, ich komme erst heute auf die Welt, dass ich nicht sehen soll, wo alles hinaus will? Ihr tut uns Unrecht! Preisregen. Soll ich von der Leber weg reden? Ich bin euch ein Dorn in den Augen, so klein ich bin. Goetz was the leader of the oppressed peasants in their revolt against the landowners in 1525. In Goethe's play, he's an idealized figure. In as far as he allows his feelings to dictate his actions, he's a symbol of the entire storm and stress movement. Und du weißt, Ringen ist ihr Werkzeug. Berlich Hingen! Nichts mehr davon. Ich bin kein Freund von Explikationen. Man betrügt sich oder den anderen. Und meist beide. Zu Tisch, Vater! Fröhliche Botschaft! Komm! Ich hoffe, meine Weibsleute sollen euch munter machen. Ihr wart sonst ein Liebhaber. Die Fräuleins wussten von euch zu erzählen. Komm! This is the Imperial Law Court in Wetzlar, the Supreme Court of the old German Empire. Goethe arrives in Wetzlar in May 1772 to complete his legal training as an advocate. The court there is well known for its long trials which can last for years. Goethe has plenty of time to explore the social life of the small town and soon after his arrival he attends a country ball. He's asked to call for a young girl on the way. Her name is Charlotte Buff. She's an attractive girl of medium build. And Goethe first meets her as she's cutting bread for her younger brothers and sisters. Since the death of her mother, Lotte, as she's generally known, has been running the house for her father. Before their first dance together is over, Goethe has fallen in love. How gracefully she moved. I was completely carried away. I held the most beautiful of creatures in my arms. I flew with her like the wind, and I soon forgot everything else around me. Goethe asks Lotte if he may see her again. She agreed, and since that moment, the sun, moon and stars may go about their normal business. I don't know whether it's day or night. Goethe, who taught the world to say I, now learns for the first time in his life the full meaning of the word you. But Lotte is betrothed to a lawyer. In his novel Werther, Goethe gives him the name Albert. A few days later, Albert, who has been away on business, returns to Wetzlar. Goethe is desperately unhappy. In September, he leaves Wetzlar without saying farewell to his friends. He walks through the Lahn Valley. On his way, no doubt, the first lines of Werther come to him. The wonders of nature hang frozen before me as if in a varnished painting. Even the most joyful of sights is unable to lift my heart. Goethe is lost. He feels divorced from the beauty of the world. When he visits marketplaces and castle courtyards, he feels imprisoned. How often have I thrown myself to the ground and prayed to God for tears, as the ploughman prays for rain when the sky is clear and the soil dry.
I am resolved, Lotta. I shall die. And I write these words calmly, without any romantic passion. I wish to die. At midday, Goethe tells us at the end of his novel, Werther died, and they feared for Charlotta's life. Goethe returns to Frankfurt and starts work on new literary projects. Only two years later does he write Werther. When he does begin, he works quickly and feverishly, as if the novel were being dictated to him. I had shut myself off from the outside world and had asked even my friends not to visit me. Under these conditions, and after such long and secret preparations, I wrote Werther in four weeks, without any kind of draft or plan. Suicide is the most extreme form of protest available to the individual. By writing his novel, Goethe saves his own life. It's not Goethe, but Werther, who says goodbye to a world in which he feels out of place. The Sorrows of Werther is published in time for the Autumn Book Fair in 1774. The book is a spectacular success with the public. Never in the history of German literature has a novel caused such a sensation. Pirate editions, imitations, apologies and prohibitions soon follow. Even during Goethe's lifetime, the novel is translated into many languages. Goethe's last two years in Frankfurt are full of new plans and ideas, but only a few of them are ever carried out. During these years in Frankfurt, my creative talent was ever alert. What I saw during the day often reappeared in my dreams at night. Goethe begins Faust, he plans Egmont, and yet he's restless and dissatisfied. Not even his engagement to Lily Schoenemann, the daughter of a respected family, is able to content him. Goethe's family welcome news of his engagement. His parents would like their young and successful son to settle down in Frankfurt. Goethe writes in a letter dating from this period, Picture a Goethe in a trimmed frock coat, dressed from head to toe in ceremonious attire. He's seated at a card table in the empty glow of the lamps and chandeliers, held there by a beautiful pair of eyes. In a spirit of frivolity, he courts a pretty blonde. If you can imagine that, you have me as I am at the moment, a carnival Goethe. Fortunately, Goethe is soon able to escape from this way of life. Karl August, a Thuringian duke and an enthusiastic patron of the arts, invites him to Weimar. Goethe accepts the invitation. I must get away. I'd be foolish to let myself be trapped here. This life is stifling my powers and destroying my soul. I must escape. Goethe turns his back on a past which has been full, perhaps too full. Though troubled by feelings of guilt, He's full of hopes and ideas. His journey to Weimar is a journey into the future, a flight into a world of new experiences.